Hi, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health, and I'm here at the Barcelona Health Hub. Joining me right now, I have Nidhi Paul. She is the Global Medical Director for KPMG and also the Senior Mobile Health Advisor for AXA. So we are going to pick your brain, Nidhi, about trends that are shaping digital health. So first of all, it's great to have you with us. It's lovely to be here on a bright blue sunny day. Thank you. Yes, it's gorgeous. Um, so weigh in for me, I guess, from your perspective, and you're also a, a practicing GP, I understand, in the UK still. That's right. That's awesome. So I, I wanted to get your, your input first and foremost about how we can involve clinicians more in the innovation process. What's your opinion on that? So um, I think it starts with training of clinicians. Uh, with clinicians, you know, in our medical training, uh, nobody even talks about innovation in that kind of way. And if we talk about innovation, it's usually related to drug discovery or innovation around surgical procedures, but not innovation, innovation as a topic in itself. So I think it starts with actually um, talking to medical students as they're starting their training about what innovation is going to mean and what transformative forces we're seeing in healthcare currently and what consumers of healthcare are really looking for. Uh, and then secondly, clinicians are very motivated to actually do the best by their patients. So the patient experience really matters. And to a patient, the experience of affordability, accessibility of healthcare is really important. So I think clinicians starting to understand that their patients are looking for something different is the best way to start to involve clinicians. Now you've been studying this M Health space as it's evolved into digital health and the name keep changing. Now it's health tech, right? And so what have you noticed, I guess, over, over this period of time that you've been watching this space? Give us the state of play of where we're at right now? So I think it's a it's a real thing. Uh, it's not just kind of a buzzword which is here today and gone tomorrow. It's going to stay. Uh, so it's not something that is going to vanish. It'll be a different form, but it'll still be here. And I think it's also a manifestation of uh, 21st century healthcare. So it's not the 20th century, not the 19th century, it's proper 21st century healthcare where everything is tech, it's digital, uh, and healthcare has finally landed that. So I think that's the one thing I would say. Two, I would say there are huge challenges in healthcare and the health ecosystem and systems around the world, and I work in about 41 countries around the world, uh, is that you're going to have a huge shortage of healthcare professionals. And we know that, and every country in the world knows that. So you're not going to be able to rely on fully trained health doctors and nurses to deliver healthcare. You're going to have to find different solutions. And technology is solving some of those. So M Health and technology is solving some of that. And again, that's here to stay. And three, we are finding more innovative and more, uh, I guess, disruptive forces, not in mature markets, but in immature markets, where there aren't these doctors and nurses. And consumers do want to spend their pound, their penny, where it's out of pocket wisely and well. So they're finding some of these solutions themselves. Okay, share with me some of those. I'm curious from what you've seen. I mean, I was going to jump on the fact that you mentioned 40 different com countries. And I, mean, I think th where you've been in the world, I mean, you've seen some very wealthy countries or some countries that are wealthy that are spending exorbitant amount of money on healthcare, like the US. And you've gone, I mean, to places like Bl Bangladesh. Um, and I believe you even mentioned Africa. So give me, weigh in for me. What are some of the best, I guess, hacks that you've seen of health care um, as you've traveled the world? So the most, Im the most interesting one for me in the last kind of three years and probably the most impactful one in my 30 year career has been uh, Tonic in Bangladesh, where a new provider of healthcare has emerged. And that new provider of healthcare is a telco. So a telephone company that's decided to enter the healthcare space. Uh, they're the distributor. They have, uh, in Bangladesh, they have 55 million consumers already that buy their SIM cards. So they've got a customer base already. They're trying to look at value add services, how it started, and then it shifted, it actually pivoted to actually being a healthcare uh, technology startup themselves. So Tonic started from start to finish. It has three bits to it, everyday health engagement. How do you engage with the customer consumer even when they're not ill? Uh, the second bit is access to a doctor 24-7, doctor, nurse, who, a healthcare professional 24-7. And three, how do you pay for it? So in Bangladesh, 90% in of the healthcare spend is out of pocket. How do you get to pay for it? How do you in include people? How do you stop people from falling into poverty? And that's the insurance or microinsurance bit of it. In Bangladesh, is a very strong microinsurance movement. So we tack that on uh, both as a health plan, uh, as a savings plan, subscription, as well as insurance. Difficult to get across the customer consumer well, but a health wallet was created. And from start to finish, this took 18 months and 6.5 million people are using it now. 
Oh my goodness. I was going to ask you how long this took because I'm if, here in the, I mean, in the U S we're watching, you know, non healthcare, non like non-traditional healthcare players enter into the space. And it's like, things are evolving. It seems like so slowly because of the regulations and things like that. But 18 months, I mean, that's unbelievable. I mean, I, how did, how did they navigate the regulatory environment around that? And how did, I, I mean, also I'm curious, how did a telco get up to speed on what they needed to know? Cause everybody is always saying how difficult healthcare is, how nuanced it is. So uh, there's a lot of questions in your one little question. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the one is that they wanted to be a healthcare pl provider. So they weren't coming in this as being a telco. That's the one important thing to remember. And to be a healthcare provider, you have to behave differently. And the, and the second bit was they hired a proper team who had healthcare, deep healthcare expertise to do it, and a, and a, a team of advisors who could help them do that. Uh, you know, when I started working with them, uh, and I sit on their board, and I supervise their clinical risk and quality committee, I made them do clinical risk and quality in exactly the same way as a bricks and mortar provider would do. So the patient safety incidents are reported in exactly the same way, the quality is held in exactly the same way, the governance team is exactly the same. And in Bangladesh, we didn't have to do this, but we did it because I think it's important to the customer consumer to understand this is a trustworthy uh, place to come to for your healthcare, which is really, really important. Uh, and then finally, um, I think the will was there to be different and to do this differently. And like I said, uh, there is a big, um, there's a big online, offline play as well in this, in the health ecosystem, because they're not healthcare providers, as you've said. Uh, so they were looking at partnering with offline providers, particularly people within communities, like the BRAC workers, people, community workers who get out, were the influencers on where people buy the healthcare and where they access the healthcare. So that online, offline play help, uh, also helped to get this uh, thing moving. And all I can say is, and I'm very humbled by it, one of the poorest countries in the world has shown the world a way in which healthcare could be delivered at $11 a head a year. That's incredible, $11 a head. Yeah. So how did the traditional healthcare system in Bangladesh react to this? Uh, quite well, actually. Really? I, I think they were, uh, they're so overwhelmed. If you walk into a public hospital, even a private hospital in Bangladesh, uh, it's, it's almost Dickensian in its... Uh, in its look, uh, you walk in there and you you and I, I can you know challenge anyone to walk in there and not come out crying. So you know it's 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 in a in some of it and they, the doctors and nurses there are heroes and they're doing heroic jobs. They really are. Uh, so they're overwhelmed and they're looking for solutions that can help their day to day life easier. So actually there was no challenge by them. They said, all right, so how can you help me? And that's kind of how it started. We're working with a very large um, uh, diabetes center there, and they're actually taking part in a very good experiment on delivering a diabetes care management program, which their doctors and nurses are, are helping with because they don't want the 800 or 1,000 patients that they have to see a day between six doctors. So what are you most excited about when you look f toward the future? I mean, this is, a, I mean, a major disruption. And just even hearing the story gets me excited about the potential of, you know, what could be done if there's the will ar around it, the right team of people is assembled and all, all of those things kind of click into place. But what has you more, most excited about the future of health? So uh, I think there's lots of things that excite me currently. And I think uh, the understanding that clinicians as well as consumers are understanding this is something here to stay. It's not here today and gone tomorrow. So that's really exciting. Two, I think that tech is now developing at such pace in terms of the AI that sits behind this. Uh, I think there's been a lot of hype and people have been disappointed yeah. in some of you know what this is going to do. But if you look at it carefully and dissect it, uh, in some countries, uh, it's about being good enough it may not be about being the super duper all accurate, 100%. Doctors are not 100% accurate. I've been a doctor 30 years. I'm never 100% accurate. So just getting to understand that, that, that's exciting. And then two, I think adding that on to digital therapeutics as well as digital diagnostics, adding the front digital front door to it. And I'm finding some very interesting models emerge in places like India where uh, a lab company that uh, I worked two lab companies that I worked with uh, have got they've got a huge customer base uh, and they will they have a digital front door that is interacting with the consumer being a lab company they're interacting with the consumer differently they own the customer consumer not the clinician so it's a very different piece those guys are starting to disrupt both point of care testing diagnostics the way they interact with the consumer how information is handed out and consumers are reacting to that really well so I think that's a big 
disruption we're going to see on the digital diagnostic side. And if you layer that data with the data that diagnostics is throwing up, put it together with perhaps the genome sequencing data of, of, of a person, you're going to get to personalized medicine very, very fast. And I believe that's going to happen in the next five or six years very quickly. Say, some, say a little bit about healthcare consumers and trust. Because I, we were talking about this earlier, and I, I, I love to hear you evangelize about this. So what, what are tech companies missing when it comes to understanding the, the importance of trust when it comes down to engaging with the healthcare consumer? Because as exciting as all these ideas are, you know, ultimately, you're going to need to establish that relationship with a patient, with a, with a consumer. Quite so. So uh, absolutely right. And having tried to do this in many markets and to understand what healthcare consumers are looking for, and healthcare consumers don't change wherever in the world I've been. And it's only four things, and I've tested this in many markets, exactly the same thing. The first thing is trust. The second thing is empathy. Next is expertise and information. If you don't get the first two right, people will not take your expertise and information. They'll go find another doctor and they'll go find a third one, they'll find a fourth one who can give them the first two to feel comfortable. It's such a personal thing, health. And when you're ill and you're worried, that's the thing you're looking for. So tech companies that don't pay attention to the trust bit, building that trust. And how do you build that trust? The first thing we did in Tonic was to retrain the doctors at the end of a phone, how to take the phone call properly. And that was not about whether they knew the clinical things well, they knew uh, what, you know, how to record in the EMR. It was actually to listen to the customer consumer, to follow the cues that the patient was worried about. All of the things that they teach you, but it's much harder to do when you're sitting at the back end of a phone where the patient can't see you, you can't see their face. So even if it's a video consultation, sometimes you can't pick up the nonverbal cues that uh, the patient is coming with. So that's the bit that you really do need to pay attention to. And it's also, you know, sort of, which is why, you know, the back end, the, the logistics of the back end, the clinical governance, the quality, just publishing the quality data, making sure there's no safety incidents, no major incidents have happened. We're a, a company that collects all of this and makes sure that we're putting, keeping you safe. All of that is important to building trust. Absolutely. Thank you so much for stopping by and chatting with us. It's a pleasure to hear your insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed speaking to you. Likewise. I'm Jessica Namasa with WTF Health. Thanks so much for joining us.